and uh, it's a series on love isn't blind and she talked about our relationship with the church and if you missed it you can just go to YouTube search for Life Unlimited Church subscribe and you can watch it again you can even fast forward through things and all the rest of it but it was an exceptional message this morning we it's still in the series, Love Is and Blind, which is dealing with a whole lot of things, including unrealistic expectations we bring to the church, to relationships, to other things. And we're talking about our relationship with God. And I want to suggest to you that there are four foundational truths that can help us with our relationship with God. Now, there's a whole lot of other stuff, but I want to focus on just four things initially to set this up. Number one, God reveals himself to us. Number two, God alone is sovereign. Number three, God is faithful to us. And most importantly of all, God loves us. So let's just talk for a moment that God reveals himself to us. If God did not choose to reveal himself to us, we could never, ever know him. And the Bible says he reveals himself to us, number one, in creation, Paul says in Romans 1 and verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made. And then he goes on to say that you and I can be without excuse before God. He's revealed himself in the glory of creation. The second thing, he reveals himself through our conscience or in our conscience. Again, Paul, writing in Romans chapter 2 and verse 14 and following, speaking of Gentiles, those who didn't grow up under the Jewish law, which revealed the Ten Commandments, he says, those who never engaged with the Ten Commandments, Gentiles who do not have God's written law, show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it. They demonstrate God's law written in their hearts, their own conscience and thoughts. Either excuse them or tell them they are doing right. So in creation, in our conscience, God reveals himself. And then in the wonder of scripture, 66 books, multiple authors, but a single theme revealing the plan, the purpose of God ultimately accomplished in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says a whole lot of things about itself, but it is the truth that God speaks into our lives. And that's why we encourage daily devotions that we are continually engaging with God's word. Even if you have to wrestle with some things that don't really seem to make a lot of sense or, or you don't understand it, but the ongoing investing in God's word and getting God's word in you is a powerful thing. And the Bible says that it teaches us what is true, it corrects us, it redirects us, and that it empowers us to live a fruitful life. But ultimately, the primary goal of Scripture is to reveal Jesus to us. Jesus speaking to a group of people who knew the Old Testament incredibly well, and that's the Scriptures he's referring to. He says, you search the Scriptures because you think they will give you eternal life. As important as the word of God is, just searching the scriptures doesn't give you eternal life. They all point, Jesus says, to him. And it's when you encounter him and put your trust in him that you get eternal life. But all of scripture ultimately is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, his work, his death, his resurrection, his ministry, how he engaged with people. And so that's the fourth way in which God reveals himself to us. I love these words from the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 1 verse 1 to 3. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. He's spoken to us through Jesus. You want to know what God is like? Read the Gospels. Look at what Jesus says, what he does, and how he engages with people. And then the writer of Hebrews says this, and the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. 
You want to know what God's like? Read the Gospels. Look at who Jesus is, what he does, what he says, how he engages people. So we come to the second one, that God is sovereign. And it means that he rules over all, even when things seem chaotic in our lives or in our world and nothing really makes sense. God has not lost control. He's sovereign. He rules over all. And in our world today, we are experiencing what some are calling a crisis of change. Life is changing so quickly, so rapidly, and to such extremes in certain things that it creates a, a, an anxiety, a panic within people's hearts. But in the chaos, those of us who name Jesus as our Lord and Savior can point to a sovereign God as a fixed point that can anchor our lives, speak into our anxiety, direct us and lead us because he's sovereign. The psalmist puts it this way, and I'm just looking at one verse that re, re celebrates the sovereignty of God. The Lord reigns, he's robed in majesty, the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength indeed. The world is established firm and secure. You see, when you encounter the majesty of God, the rule of God, the sovereignty of God, suddenly your world becomes a lot more established, firm and secure because despite the chaos, despite the pain, despite the disappointment, you got God actually knows what's going on here and God has a way forward for me because he's the sovereign Lord. The third thing is God's faithfulness. I love Lamentations chapter three and the context of the book of Lamentations. It is actually a lament, a pouring out of sorrow over the destruction of Jerusalem, the devastation that happened when the Babylonians who swept through, destroyed things, took people captive. And there was chaos everywhere. And Jeremiah laments, he weeps over the pain, the loss, the destruction that had come about because of Israel's disobedience. But then he says this, because of the Lord's great love, great love is translated in some things as steadfast or faithful love. Because of the Lord's great faithful love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. And they are new every morning. And then this anthem of praise, great is your faithfulness. Paul says something quite astonishing in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He, he lists a number of faithful sayings, trustworthy sayings. And he says, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful for he cannot deny who he is. He's a faithful God. And the, the reality is every one of us in some way within thought, in deed, in attitude, have been unfaithful to God. And sometimes the devil loves to jump, dump shame and guilt and condemnation and try to isolate us from the love of God. But it says even when we're unfaithful, it's not our encouraging us to be unfaithful, but he says even when that happens, you come back to a faithful God who's faithful to forgive, who's faithful to cleanse, who's faithful to take you on from where you are and redirect your life because he cannot deny his nature. He is a faithful God. And then God is love. So we celebrate that God reveals himself, that God is sovereign, that God is faithful, that God is love. And love from God's heart is not just an emotion. So much of our world today describes it as an emotion or lives as if it's only an emotion. But from God's point of view, it's a commitment, it's a dedication, it's a giving of himself. And somebody said that love is an event in which God for himself spoke into humanity by his son. People have all these opinions about the nature of God, an angry God, an impatient God, and all these things that have gone on for, for centuries and for the millennia of people giving their opinion about God. But you look to the cross and there is God speaking for himself. God is love. God is so loved that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him 
would not perish but have everlasting love. The cross is this voice of God speaking to humanity. I love you. I will give my best for you so I can be in relationship with you. And John, the beloved apostle, In 1 John, celebrates this throughout the thing. But listen to what he says in 1 John 4 verse 9. God showed, God demonstrated, God revealed, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Well, what's real love? That God showed Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. If you're not sure about God's love, take a moment and look at the cross. That is God demonstrating, showing how much he loves you, loves me, loves us, loves the world. John comes to this kind of conclusion a little bit later in 1 John, and I love these words. We know and rely on the love that God has for us. You want to get through life, you want to live a more overcoming, victorious life. It's got to be anchored in the fact that you know and you rely on the fact that God loves you even when you don't always feel like he does. Even when you sometimes cannot sense his presence, you keep looking back to Calvary and say, God, you demonstrated your love to me. And I just take hold of it. We, I rely on the fact that you love me. No matter what is going on in my world, no matter what happens in my circumstances, no, no matter what, how good or bad my choices are, when I keep coming back to you, I encounter a God who loves me. I rely on the love of God, not on my performance or your performance or how many good works you can do. And God wants us to do great things and make the difference in our world. But he says, John says, I rely, I know, and I rely on the love of God. For God is love. And whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And there is no fear in love. And he's talking about the fear of condemnation, of punishment, of us never being good enough. He says, just stop that. Rely on the love of God. Get to know the love of God. And so we've got these four truths and there's a whole lot of other ones we could add to it about the nature of God. But in a sense, for me, this established like a table that we can build something on. These four fundamental truths that God reveals himself to us, that God is sovereign. There is a God and you're not him. It's a foundational truth that we should hang on to. There is a God and we are not him but that he is a faithful God and he's a loving God who reveals himself to us. And I set that up because I want us then to just talk a little bit about the reality of life and our experience. And you may be going through this right now or you've just come out of it or maybe you'll be heading into it. But there are times when we struggle to believe that God loves us. We're struggling with failure. We're struggling with condemnation. We we feel like God has abandoned us. Our prayers are unanswered. There's chaos going on in my family. I'm struggling with illness. I'm struggling with financial pressure and I've been crying out and God, where are you? And it seems like the heavens are like brass. And when you're in that, you sometimes get this feeling, I wonder if God's lost me, if he doesn't know where I am. Uh, Maybe I've done something to offend him so much that he'll never ever answer a prayer of mine again. Maybe he's walked away from me. When we say those things, we go, no, 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 no. But the reality, we think them sometimes. They're part of the struggle of our thoughts and our hearts. And it's kind of relatively easy to believe that God loves the world 
but it's a little bit harder to go, he loves me. He hasn't forgotten me. He hasn't abandoned me. Despite the reality of life that I'm struggling with at the moment. There's often this cry from our heart. God, where are you? Why aren't you helping me? David, a man after God's own heart, pens these words. God, why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Now, as you read through the rest of Psalm 10, you'll find that David resolves that. But it's not an uncommon thought for David to say, God, where are you? Why aren't you? And and when are you? Aren't those some of the things that occupy our heart, our thoughts? Even Jesus, the beloved son of God, on the cross, laying down his life for us in extraordinary pain. And it's not just the physical pain of the beating, the crown of thorns, the nails that tied him to the tree, to the cross. But this carrying the weight of our sin and brokenness, maybe that was the greater pain. And about three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabach deny. Probably mispronounced by me. Not trying to be trite about that. And Matthew, the other gospel writers interpret, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is in humanity, fully God and fully human. But Jesus in humanity identifies with that sense, God in the pain, in the loss, in where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Why, God? Why? And we all harbor unrealistic expectations about life, about what we expect from other people, but also about what we expect from God. And it's hard to push those unrealistic expectations down sometimes or to ignore them. Uh, And I'm not suggesting we should. In fact, part of what I'm trying to say this morning in understanding that God reveals himself, that God is sovereign over all things and he hasn't lost control and that he is faithful and he's loving, is to acknowledge, despite kind of knowing that here, in here we sometimes feel, God, you are letting me down. I am so, so disappointed in your performance. We don't always say that because it sounds sacrilege. But we think it, we feel it, we wrestle with it. And with its unrealistic expectations about life, about other people, about God, if we stay in that unrealistic expectation, it becomes a very hard place to escape from in our thinking and in the choices that we make. And one of the most dangerous places for our unrealistic expectations is what we think and what we project onto God about what he should have done in my circumstance in my life. All of us have prayed prayers, not submitting to God, but actually advising him how he could do better in our lives. Come on. Divine hints. Uh, God, may I suggest to you (laughs) that you could do this, this, or this. And some of the most bitter and angry people in our culture are people who feel that they've been betrayed by God, let down by God. But expectations are not reality. (laughs) And we all have them. And we all have to engage with them and we all have to work it through, but they are not reality and seldom do they become our reality. 
Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't live with hope and expectation, but that's biblical hope and expectation is a slightly different concept to the stuff that we put onto other people, expect of life and sometimes expect of God. Apart from Luke 15, probably Romans 8 is one of my favourite passages where Paul is speaking to the church at Rome that's going through all sorts of stuff. And as you read through the chapter, there are some great themes. One of them is the work of the Spirit in our heart, in our lives, in a whole lot of ways, which I'm not going to touch on today. The other is he actually is talking about God's sovereignty, God's faithfulness, God's love. He, he may not use those exact words, but those concepts are woven through Romans chapter 8. And you may not be familiar with the chapter, and I'd encourage you to read it and make a note of a few things I'm going to draw out of it to speak to this thing of unrealistic expectations of God. And I think the important thing is we read it is, I love something that John Stott, a great theologian said, talking about this chapter. If you really get what God is saying to us through the things Paul writes in this chapter, you'll find a pillow on which to rest your weary head. You'll find some answers. You'll find some solutions. I don't mean that suddenly God will do what you demand or expect of him, but I'm talking about engage in your heart where it renews your mind and opens yourself again in a fresh and a new way to God. The other thing before I just give you the four key things that I think are so important to us in engaging with unrealistic expectations or disappointment with God or frustration with unanswered prayer is to understand the people that he's speaking to. He's not speaking to perfect Christians living in idyllic circumstances. If you read some of the adjectives that describe what people are going through that Paul is speaking to, you find he's speaking to people who are facing severe, severe persecution who are caught up in terrible circumstances of great loss and pain because of that persecution. There are people who feel so weak that they actually don't know what to pray anymore. He's speaking to people who are groaning under the weight of their circumstance and their present suffering and the tribulation that is afflicting them. He's speaking to people who talk about being so frustrated, who feel like they are in bondage. There's the word of decay, that things are kind of just decaying, whether in themselves, in their circumstance, in their relationships. The word trouble and hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, slaughter, demonic attack are all the phrases that are used in this passage. So he's not talking to perfect people who've got it all together. He's not talking to people who live in, in paradise. In fact, far from it. He's talking to people who are filled with self-doubt and may be questioning the heart of God towards them. And he declares four powerful truths that speak down through the centuries to us today. Number one, whatever is going in your world, there's no condemnation from the heart of God towards you the opening declaration of Romans 
chapter 8, verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Whatever you've been caught up in, whatever disobedience, whatever wrong choices, where the enemy loves to dump shame and guilt and condemnation and weight on you, hear the clarion declaration of the possible coming from the heart of God. There is no condemnation if you belong to Jesus. There is no condemnation to those for those who belong to Jesus. And that his spirit is working in you, even through the sin and the brokenness and the wrong choices. Now, it's not giving us a license to do whatever and to be rebellious, but even if that has been a choice you made, when you come back to the Father, he runs to meet you and he doesn't dump guilt and condemnation and guilt. He may convict you so you can turn and embrace his love, but you are not a condemned people. We are not condemned because we belong to Jesus. The second thing he says that there's no loss. You go, whoa, I can point to a whole lot of loss in my life, a whole lot of loss. He says, no, there's no loss. Life is not the random mess that it sometimes appears and nothing is ever wasted in God's economy. Listen to what he says in Romans 8 verse 28. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purposes. Every detail of your life, the good, the bad, the great, the terrible choices, God has the ability to weave them together and turn something terrible into something that is extraordinarily good in your life if you just put it in his hands. He says all things, not just some things. God is able to work all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to purpose. The third thing is there's no defeat. You and I often feel defeated in ourselves, in our circumstances, in situations. But in Romans 8 and verse 37, it says, Now despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ and the reminder who loved us and continues to love us. His love will see you through. His love will minister to your broken heart. His love will cover you and protect you and bring you to your final destination, which is an eternal relationship with him. Self-sufficiency and self-reliance is so unrealistic. The reality is, that you and I are packages of weakness held together by divine grace. We are packages of weakness. Yeah, we rise up in faith, we believe God, we are strengthened on the, in the inner man, but ultimately we are packages of weakness held together by God's grace. The final thing he says is there's no separation. And I'm just gonna read these words in Romans 8. 38 and following, Paul says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So how do we respond? I think the only thing we can do is worship in our pain, in our brokenness, in our frustration, struggling with our unanswered prayers and the pressing needs and the anxiety about tomorrow. There's a call always to us as followers of Jesus to worship. And maybe to ask 
do I need to allow the Holy Spirit to correct an unrealistic expectation in my thinking? Not to abandon goals or dreams or ambitions, but am I putting an incorrect, unrealistic demand on life, on people, on God? And it's at that point we bring our unrealistic expectation to God and it becomes worship. A distinguished art critic, Robert Cumming, in the London Gallery, was studying an exquisite painting by the Italian Renaissance master, Filippino Lippi. It was a depiction of Mary holding the infant Jesus on her lap. And two of the saints, Dominic, early church fathers, and Jerome kneeling nearby. And there was no doubting Lippi's skill, his use of color and the composition of this extraordinary painting. But the proportions of the picture seem completely wrong. The background hills seemed exaggerated. The two kneeling saints looked awkward and kind of out of place. And art critics for centuries had criticized this as one of his poorer paintings. Cummings was not the first to criticize Lippi's poor perspective. And then he had a moment of revelation. And he recalled that the painting was not commissioned to hang in a gallery, but in a prayer chapel. And he felt his knees in front of it. And suddenly it was perfect. In the act of surrender, in the act of kneeling, things came into perspective. Maybe that's what we need to do. In all the crazy, in all the frustration, in all the unanswered prayers that we may be struggling with or the unanswered prayer, fall to our knees in worship. One of my favorite hymns, penned by Isaac Watts when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride see from his head his hands his feet Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Can we just stand in God's presence? Everything in our world changes when we belong to Jesus. And I'm going to ask the simple question, do you know that you belong to Him? It's not a religious question, it's a trust question. Have you come to God and put your trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, in what He accomplished to reconcile us to God? Mm -hmm.